Hi everyone, hope that uh, you're all safe and well. I'd like to start off this week's message with a recap of a more recent famous video experiment that was conducted by a couple of psychologists uh, named Christopher Chabri and Daniel Simons. The experiment is referred to as the Invisible Gorilla Experiment. And I previously forwarded it uh, to you as a YouTube clip. Hope that you were able to see it and enjoy it. This experiment, uh, it showed that many of us, many of us are potentially susceptible to and can experience, they call it a cognitive phenomenon called inattention blindness. Inattention blindness. And in this condition, inattention blindness, it does not allow a person, if you have it, you or I, to focus their attention on more than one thing at a time. And in this condition of inattention blindness, it can also cause that same person, you or I, if we have it, to fail to see or miss something that could be right in front of us. We can fail to see that if uh, we have this condition. And it's a helpful reminder and awareness for our daily lives if indeed we do have that condition especially when we're doing things like driving, okay, not to multitask. In our spiritual lives, in our spiritual lives, there's a very similar condition. I would call it spiritual inattention blindness. Spiritual inattention blindness, also known as hardness of heart. Hardness of heart. We also need to be highly aware of this condition and on guard against it because in spiritual inattention blindness, this failing to see, it can have serious, adverse, fatal, eternal consequences for all of us. So as we continue our journey through the Gospel of John, may the Holy Spirit soften our hearts and help us all to be attentive to the Lord's truths, his best for our lives. Our passage is taken from John chapter 8, verses 13 through 20, a portion of which was shown at the beginning of our message clip. Let me read it for us. Uh, I'm actually going to start with verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Pharisees challenged him. Here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. For I know where I come, came from and where I am going. But you, you have no idea where I come from or where I am going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are true because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am one, one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. And then they asked him, Where is your Father? You do not know me or my Father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. So the setting of our passage, a continuation from last week's message, it takes place in the city of Jerusalem, in the temple courts uh, where the place of the offerings was done. The passage, uh, this passage followed the great feast of the tabernacles, the feast of the shelters, that had taken, recently taken place within the city of Jerusalem, the festival where Jesus had publicly revealed and pronounced himself as the never-ending 
source of living water for all, for anyone who was spiritually thirsty. This pronouncement created great division among the gathered crowd, but this pronouncement also hardened the hearts and it also revealed the unbelief of the Jewish religious leaders. The setting of our passage also immediately followed the story of Jesus' forgiveness of the woman who had been caught in the act of adultery by the same religious leaders. And through the truth of that story, we learned of the awesome power of Jesus, of God's forgiveness. It was and is a forgiveness available to all who believe and entrust their hearts to the Lord Jesus. A forgiveness that breaks, breaks the power of condemnation and a forgiveness that breaks the power of guilt and shame over one's life. And from last week's message, we looked at the second, the second of Jesus' incredible I am statements. An I am statement was the pronouncement of his true identity as the unique God-man and Messiah. And Jesus uniquely was and is from last week's message, the light of the world who pushes back the darkness, the darkness of evil, sin, falsehood of the human heart and of our world. And he's also the light who brings life, a light which illumines the human heart for all who will receive and accept him. Uh, and what happens is a life-changing and life-transforming truth that happens for each individual. For all who believe and follow Jesus, he lights the way for true life, an abundant and fruitful life here and now, full of meaning and purpose, and also and also an eternal life after this short earthly life comes to an end. An eternal life which is a forever friendship with God. And again, a life without end. So what truths are revealed from our study of this week's passage that can help us all to not miss out on God's best for our lives and what oftentimes is right in front of us? right in front of us. A couple of truths that we can look at. The first one is this. Our first truth is not to be self-deceived. Not to be self-deceived. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth, the truth of God, is not in us. This uh, story uh, comes from the New York Times, uh, dated uh, July 13th uh, from this year. And it's a coronavirus story, a tragic story of self-deception. This story uh, talked about the consequences of not believing the truth regarding the seriousness and highly contagious nature of the coronavirus. A 30-year-old man from Texas recently died from complications of this virus in a San Antonio hospital. And one of the saddest parts of this story was how this man contracted the deadly virus. He said that he had been infected after attending what he called a COVID party, a COVID party. And these COVID parties are gatherings of primarily younger age people who attend knowing that there's someone there in their midst who has been infected with this virus. And they attend purposely to see if they also will come down with the coronavirus. Hard to believe, but very sadly true. And for this young man who was in the prime of his life, the reason he attended was, quote, to test to see if the virus was real, unquote. 
He was blind to what was right in front of him, the reality of what was right in front of him. And some of this man's last spoken words were these, this quote, quote, I think I made a mistake. I thought the virus was a hoax, but it's not, unquote. The virus is real. It's contagious and oftentimes very deadly. So for all of us, please continue to take the proper precautions to wear a mask, to keep appropriate social distance from others, to avoid large gatherings, crowds of people, and especially COVID parties, and to wash and sanitize your hands. Self-deception. The meaning of self-deception or definition is the action or the practice of allowing oneself or ourselves to believe that a false idea, a false situation, or a false feeling is actually true. Again, this definition of self-deception, the action or practice of, of allowing ourselves to believe that a false idea, situation, or feeling is actually true. From our passage, the Pharisees who were part of the Jewish religious leadership, they did not recognize Jesus as their long-awaited Messiah. And the reason was, Jesus didn't fit their expectations of what the Messiah should look like or who he was expected to be. The Pharisees' expectation was that G the Messiah was to be a warrior king similar to King David of the Old Testament. The Messiah was to be a deliverer, someone who would militarily set the Jewish people free from their Roman oppressors. And the Messiah was to be a ruling king over the Jewish people who would restore and reestablish Israel's greatness. But instead, when the Pharisees saw Jesus, what they saw was a Messiah wannabe, a fraud, a fake. The Pharisees saw Jesus as a deceiver of the people, someone who actually kept company with sinners, people that the Pharisees would not want to be close to. And the Pharisees saw Jesus as a blasphemer of God. So because of their own self-deception and the spiritual hardness of their hearts, the Pharisees rejected Jesus, they opposed him, and they secretly plotted to kill him. And so in this case, they judged and they challenged Jesus' pronouncement of calling himself the light of the world. The Pharisees said that Jesus' testimony about himself was inadequate, not sufficient. Because according to Jewish law, any such statement made, it needed to be verified by two independent witnesses before it could be regarded as true. However, Jesus countered the Pharisees by saying this, his own witness was more than enough qualification enough because Jesus knew his identity, where he came from and where he was going, which was heaven. While the Pharisees, they didn't know and they didn't even have a clue about Jesus' true identity. Jesus countered the Pharisees also by saying that they made erroneous judgments and decisions frequently based on their limited and a fallible human understanding. And while Jesus did not come into the world to judge, he was more than qualified to judge because his understanding was not limited. His understanding was infallible. Because Jesus knew the whole truth, he was the living embodiment of truth. And because Jesus was one with God, he was God. 
And Jesus countered the Pharisees by saying that he did in fact have a second witness. That second witness was his heavenly father. God the Father who testified to Jesus' divine and true authority as the light of the world. He had been sent into the world by his heavenly Father to save the world. And likewise, how easy is it for us, any of us, to be or to become self-deceived or spiritually blind to the way of the Lord. So sure of ourselves, so sure of our perception of what we think is the truth based on our oftentimes fallible and limited human understanding or expectations. And what ends up happening because of that, we can't recognize the real truth, the truth of God that could be right in front of us. What is our protection against being self-deceived? A couple of things. First, it's to be filled with the Holy Spirit. When we believe and follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and we're given by the Lord godly discernment, something that we need to practice and ex exercise. Our protection against being self-deceived is also to listen to, to obey, and to stand in the truth of the Word of God. That's why we all need to study, to memorize, and to know what's in our Bibles, the truth of God. So what can help us all not to miss out on God's best for our lives? Again, what oftentimes could be right in front of us, it's not to be self-deceived. Not to be self-deceived. And a second truth revealed from our passage that can help us not to miss out on God's best for our lives is this, not to be spiritually ignorant. Not to be spiritually ignorant. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, for the Christians in Ephesus uh, not to live like the Gentiles, or another word could be pagans, because from the passage, their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because of their ignorance. They have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him, against God. From the files of, you've got to be kidding me, a sad but true story taken from the New York post this past week an example of the damage done from ignorance, human ignorance. A Michigan couple, Greg and Kirsten Offenecker, who, who own the Nordic Bed and Breakfast Inn located in St. John's, Michigan, they announced this past week that they would be removing a Norwegian flag from the front of their business. The reason for the flag's removal, because it had been mistaken for the now vilified Civil War era Confederate flag. And the couple was wrongly and ignorantly accused of supporting racism. So they decided to take that flag down. In the past few months of the protests that we've seen taking place across our nation, uh, the Offenneckers had received at least a dozen hateful emails and twice as many comments about that Norwegian flag. Kirsten Offenecker, whose grandfather was born in Norway and who grew up with both the Norwegian flag as well as the flag of the United States, was initially panicked by those emails that she received. And she still cannot understand why people cannot see the differences in those two distinct flags. They're not the same. Her husband, Greg Offenecker, who happens to be a Navy veteran and who served in Desert Storm, he added this. 
He was simply dumbfounded. Dumbfounded that some people regularly confused, again, the two flags, the Norwegian flag and the flag of the Confederacy. And unfortunately and sadly, because of the current cultural climate going on in our country and the misconceived and ignorant judgment of other people, an innocent and hardworking couple, they felt forced to succumb to the pressures from an out of control, we would call it cancel culture mob. What is ignorance? Ignorance is simply defined as a lack of knowledge or information, either about something or someone. What is the definition or biblical definition of sp spiritual ignorance? We can define it as this. Spiritual ignorance refers to people who have never heard the good news of Jesus, but it can also refer to people, those who have heard the good news of Jesus, but who willingly choose to reject it. That's spiritual ignorance. From our passage, in response to Jesus' arguments regarding their self-deception to the truth of God, the Pharisees asked him, where is your father? Where is your father? And that question revealed their ignorance of Jesus' divine nature, who he was. Jesus then admonished the Pharisees on their spiritual ignorance saying, you do not know me or my heavenly father because if you knew me, you would know my father also. And again, the Pharisees were part of the first century Jewish religious leadership. They knew the Holy Scriptures. They knew the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah, and they knew the Holy Scriptures of the prophets of the Old Testament. They also knew the law of Moses. They were legal experts in both the laws and the traditions of the Jewish people. They were also fervent experts in keeping and not breaking any of the laws or regulations, traditions. And that numbered over 2,100 plus rules and regulations. However, most importantly, the Pharisees, the Pharisees, they did not personally know God. They did not personally know God. They knew a lot about him. Uh, they knew a lot about uh, the, the scriptures and the laws of God, but they didn't know God. And while they were very pious and very religious, they were spiritually ignorant. Their hearts had become disconnected from God. And again, an extremely dangerous condition that could and would leave them spiritually dead and eternally, eternally separated from God spiritual ignorance. And what kept the Pharisees ignorant of truly knowing God and seeing Jesus as the Messiah, it was their pride, their pride, choosing their will to be done over God's greater will be done. Their will was more important. So what got in the way was their pride. What also got in the way was their self-reliance and their self-sufficiency. The Pharisees trusted in their human laws and traditions more than they trusted in and depended upon the Lord God himself. So again, what got in the way also included their self-reliance, their self-sufficiency. And likewise for us, our pride our human pride and our self-reliance and self-sufficiency, it can also keep us spiritually ignorant of truly knowing the risen Jesus, 
and personally knowing the God of the Bible. We are all in need of renew the renewing of our hearts and minds in Jesus to keep from being or becoming spiritually ignorant we must always be mindful and aware of the symptoms of spiritual pride and self-reliance self-sufficiency so some important questions we should regularly ask ourselves are these are we are we found lacking in humility a condition where we can't admit our own mistakes, our own shortcomings? Are we found lacking in humility? Are we legalistic or inflexible in how we deal with or interact with others? Are we legalistic or inflexible in how we deal with or interact with others? Are we yielding to God's way even when it gets in our way? Are we yielding to God's higher ways, even when it gets in our personal way? And are we trusting or depending upon the Lord to show up in our current situation? And if he doesn't show up, we're in big trouble. Or is it business as usual? So again, what can help us all not to miss out on God's very best for our lives is not to be spiritually ignorant. Not to be spiritually ignorant. Let me close uh, our message time with an uplifting and true story of someone who was missing what was right in front of them, but then by, by the grace of God was able to see able to see what was right in front of them. This story is taken from uh, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, uh, June of uh, 2019. Let me read it. Uh, on paper, Luca Lambruschini was a success. He was a happily married man with two daughters and a profitable company that he had built from scratch. There wasn't a thing left on his list to accomplish. In terms of real achievements, Luca had hit all the marks that he had set for himself. Still, late one night, October 2013, Luca was, was restless. He descended the stairs in his Victorian home, sat on a couch, and proceeded to turn on Netflix. The program The Gospel Road, A Story of Jesus, was one of the featured films. So Luca hit play. 90 minutes later, Luca realized his achievements and all his possessions simply paled in comparison to the love of Jesus. He said, quote, I saw that, I saw that was the only way to live life in full following Jesus, unquote. And he said, so I decided from then on that that's what I was going to do. I'm going to be exactly like him, like Jesus. Relying entirely on himself had always seemed to work in the past as Luca had checked off all of the boxes on his to-do list. But in this moment, in this moment, Luca couldn't budge. And he said, I remember myself screaming internally with all my heart, Jesus, I know you did it. I want to know how you did it. I really want to be like you. I want to be able to love like you. You've got to help me. You're the only one who can do it. And immediately, as soon as I really screamed that within my heart, boom, it was like somebody changed the software in my brain. I started seeing things, things that were right in front of me differently. Luca took a walk that night. He saw the street that he had lived on for seven years with fresh eyes. 
his neighbors with a softened heart. And he began reading the Bible and living the gospel right in front of his family. Luca never preached to his family. Instead, this once self-reliant overachiever began prioritizing his family as the Bible instructs. And within two years, Luca's wife and his two daughters made decisions for the Lord Jesus. His daughters were later baptized as well. Luca now knows firsthand that God is personal. And as a personal God, he alone knows the best strategy, the best way for reaching the people he created. After accepting Jesus into his life, Luca was led to start a monthly gospel oki taken from the word karaoke in his church. And this was a way for people there to sing their hearts out to the Lord Jesus with songs of praise and worship, gospel oki. And Luca also inquired and learned about, the Billy, about Billy Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. And he then volunteered his time with them as a discipleship coach, a discipleship coach who teaches about who Jesus is. Luca said that he enjoys helping people make sense of God's word. I love especially answering people's questions, he said, as many have similar questions about how can this be? How can this be? And for Luca, the now I see it moment in that person on the other side, the blessing of their salvation, that's what gives him joy. When they get it, when they see it for themselves, what is right in front of them. Let us close this time in a word of prayer. Thank you, dear Lord. Thank you for your great love for us. Thank you, Lord, for your desire that all would come to personally know and love you. Please help us, Lord, not to miss out on, not to take for granted what you place right in front of us. Our relationship with you the relationships that you bless us with, the different blessings in our lives and your loving presence. Help us to see what is right in front of us. Help us not to be self-deceived. Help us not to be spiritually ignorant. Thank you, Lord. Help us to draw close to you and live in the security, the grace, and the love of your presence always. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for taking this time uh, to watch and listen to uh, this week's message. And uh, stay safe and well. Have a blessed week.